Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. And this is our 100th show, featuring the recently exonerated Brooklynite John Bunn, who spent 17 years in prison for a murder he didn't commit. Plus, vinyl and craft beer, two great things that go great together. Hi, and welcome to the show. I'm Ashley Ford, and I'm joined in the studio by producer Ross Tuttle. Hello, Ross. Hello, Ashley. A lot going on today. Is it? Yeah. Mm. NFL players banned from kneeling during the anthem. We heard about that. We did hear about that, Ross. I'm pretty upset about it. It's a, a ridiculous measure that was unnecessary. And not just unnecessary, but also I think is going to cause for the NFL bigger problems than they realize. Let's hope. Let's hope. Hope. Yeah. Uh, Trump cancels the North Korea summit. Anyone surprised about that? <laughs> I am not surprised no. that Trump canceled anything. Right. I wouldn't be surprised if Trump canceled America. Isn't that kind of what he's doing? He's trying to. I think he's canceling yeah. us out. He's sort of, uh, um, what is the word, um, auctioning off our foreign policy mm. at the highest bidder. Um, then also talk about banning plastic straws, which is good. Mm -hmm. And Letitia James is now the Democrats, Democratic choice to replace Eric Schneiderman as New York's Attorney That's General. That's what I heard. But it sounds like she might be having some competition. I think we'll find out more about that next week. Mm. We'll keep our eyes peeled. Um, so it's our 100th show, as you mentioned. We're going to have John Bunn on in a second. Mm -hmm. Brings up the conversation about Louis Carcella, the detective who's been implicated in a lot of these wrongful convictions mm -hmm. that the Brooklyn DA's office has been investigating with their conviction review unit. And yes. this guy, Scarcella, and, you know, he's been in the news for the past five years since the mm -hmm. New York Times did an expose after there was a wrongful conviction overturned. Right. Um, this guy named Ranta, who was accused of um, murdering a rabbi. Uh, the, the Times called him this swaggering, cigar-chomping detective, worked in Brooklyn from the 80s and 80s and 90s, he homicide detective. Like, he sounds to me like, and I, you know, I don't want to take anything from you here, but whenever I think of him, it's like a really bad Burt Reynolds impersonator pretending to do cop work and mm. actually just destroying people's lives. Right, that would be an interesting, really dark movie, having Burt Reynolds be the dark character, not the hero. That'd oh, be, yeah. That'd be scary. Absolutely. Colin Burt. Um, well, so the DA was looking into a lot of Scarcell's case, all of the homicides that he was involved in, about mm -hmm. 70. They overturned about eight, 13 people whose sentences were vacated. The courts overturned even more. Right. Uh, 55 million paid out in settlements to these individuals, mm -hmm. 245 years plus of Ooh. time served in prison for individuals. And then John Bunn's case that came up, the exoneration last week. Interestingly right. enough, his case was so screwed up, yet the conviction review unit decided, no, we don't need to overturn this one. It was fine. Which but is we're going to find ridiculous. out a little bit more about that. When we talk to John Bunn. Well, let's get to it. Coming up, he spent 17 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. While he learned to put aside anger, pick up books, and now heads an organization to help other inmates learn how to read. And then we're gonna hear about two revivals, that of craft beer and vinyl, united in one location in Prospect Heights. Don't go away. In 1991, when John Bunn was just 14 years old, NYPD detectives burst into the home he shared with his mother, accused him of a robbery, and brought him to the station. When there, the police started questioning him about a shooting that happened the previous day in Crown Heights, where Bunn lived. Two off-duty corrections officers had been carjacked by young men on bicycles. The officers were both shot, and one would later die of his wounds. Bunn was now being charged with the murder. After a trial that lasted less than two days and didn't even include an opening statement by Bunn's lawyer, the teen was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to nine years to life. But just last week, John Bunn, now 41, was exonerated by a Brooklyn judge. We're so happy to have him here to speak with us about his case and about the mission he founded while incarcerated. Welcome, John, to 112BK. He's joined by his lawyer, assistant director of the Exoneration Initiative, Rebecca Friedman. Thanks for coming on the show as well, Rebecca. Of course. John, can we just begin with you telling me, did you expect this outcome, or were you bracing yourself for another trial? Um, 
like I didn't I didn't know what to expect. Um, after my conviction was vacated, I didn't understand the process anymore at mm -hmm. that point. So it was just like me living it day by day and, and, and you know just wondering how how my life was going to end up, mm -hmm. where it was going to go from there, what was going to be the next stages. Right. How about you, Rebecca? Um. I wouldn't say we expected another trial. I think the prosecution could have chosen to retry him. Mm -hmm. They still had their one eyewitness that they had back in 1992. Mm -hmm. He did testify at the post-conviction hearing in front of Judge Simpson. I mean, not very credibly, but he did testify. Right. So I think that they were capable of proceeding to a retrial. I don't think they would have won. Mm. So it was, I mean, and, and it was the right decision to end it as quickly as possible for John, in our mm. opinion even though, you know, that didn't happen are you, initially. So, so are you surprised that they didn't continue no, to do no. no. Because they... <laughs> I mean, like, I think at that point, once the right. appeal was, you know, once they withdrew the appeal, the writing was on the wall that this case just really had to be over. Is it rare that prosecutors back down? Um, I guess it depends on, you know, a lawyer's personal experience. We're mm -hmm. a non-DNA innocence organization, so in our practice, it's quite rare that prosecutors back down. Um, we do... We do handle a number of retrials in our cases mm -hmm. because there's no DNA evidence. Right. I can't begin to uh, imagine, to be perfectly honest, what it's like to um, have that amount of time stolen from you, to go in at 14 and to be released at 41 for something that you did not do. Can you tell me a little bit about how it even got there? How were you even implicated in this murder? Well, that's one of the goals in my mind to the outcome of the case. To I always wanted to ask them why, they, why, how, and why did they implicate me into this? Mm -hmm. And that was one of the frustrating things at going through this process and going through my hearings because even though we was able to get certain truth to light, I never got an un understanding of why why the officer actually put me in in this position, why he right. did this to my life, and you know. Like now, I had to let, like my mother always say, let go and let God. So it's like, I'm at the point where I had to let certain things go and just to move forward. Mm -hmm. And I believe like certain messages come through certain people. So right now, I just feel like my life has got a purpose through my nightmare and mm -hmm. it's blessed me with a dream in order for me to push forward. So I don't focus on the, on the, um, the nightmare part of the dream too much and like why it happened. I just look at, you know, maybe this is why. Maybe a message could come to me that can help others and prevent this from happening to other people. Yeah. And Rebecca, can you tell me how did Scarcella come into this situation? Can you explain that just for our audience? Sure. Um, detective Scarcella was the assigned detective from the Homicide Task Force mm -hmm. to handle John's case. So um, he was basically in charge of everything that was happening at the precinct. He questioned, he interrogated John without his mother while he was a minor. Mm -hmm. um, he was part and parcel of the illegal arrest that occurred in John's mother's apartment. Mm -hmm. um, he also participated in the lineup procedure from which John was identified by the only eyewitness. Um, but I think, I think probably the most disturbing factor of it was what kind of what you put your finger on before, which is that like, even now, even after years and years of litigation, post-conviction, and whatever happened pre-trial, we still don't really know why John was taken from his mother's house and put into that lineup. He did not match the description of the perpetrator. The perpetrator was supposed to be five foot nine, five foot ten, in his twenties, with light skin, and John was none of those things. I mean, and you saw the picture; he was basically a little boy. He was a kid, dark skin, he little very kid, much like maybe a kid. yeah, five foot three. Definitely, mm -hmm. no one's going to say he's twenty or he's twenty years old. No. So even if you know he had been picked up for a valid reason, which Judge Simpson found he was not, she found that it was a pretext. This whole robbery that they mm -hmm. brought him in on, and then clearly just questioned him immediately about the murder. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the paperwork shows they declined to prosecute that robbery. And it, it really was a very obvious pretext. So, I mean, the fact is it still makes no sense logically. All we can think of is that, you know, the police perhaps had some, you know, sense or idea right. or, you know, guilt by association in their minds when even that isn't borne out in right. the paperwork.
So I think like that's what's really concerning is taking a child out of his mother's home mm -hmm. and putting him in a lineup in a crime where he doesn't match the description. Right. And then he gets picked out and his entire life goes down the drain for like 30 right. years. Whew. It's everybody's worst nightmare. It's everybody's worst yeah. nightmare to and be they perfectly put me in a honest. Lineup with grown men and not only that the whole time they really had me in a precinct, they was asking me like to give them information. Like they never was claiming me and saying you did this, did this. they was trying to say, did you know this? You seen this person with a gun? I asked me specific questions about my code of fan in this particular in this particular case. But they was never saying this, but when I wound up going through it, they actually charged me as the person that was because I couldn't give them the information that they wanted. It was impossible for me to give them information I didn't have. So they yeah. and you know from what we gathered through Detective Scarcella's testimony at John's hearing and yeah. through, you know, John's recollection and his mother's recollection of what happened and his testimony in other hearings, mm -hmm. he was very cavalier about the whole process. I mean, John, what did he say to you when you got picked out of the lineup? Oh, he said, it's your lucky day. You got picked. It's your lucky day. You got picked. That is terrible. <laughs> um, John, you said when this all started, you thought the system would do its job and you'd be set free. What are your feelings about the system now? I feel, I feel, it, it's, a, it, I feel it's a double standard with the system to a certain degree when, when it comes to me because, like, in my case, I still don't feel like the system served its purpose because at the end, they didn't admit the fact that I'm innocent, and they know that I'm innocent, and I feel like it's a part of their duty when you know a person innocent to grant that justice. So I don't feel like they granted me that. And it's another thing as far as when you wrongfully convict somebody and put somebody innocent in jail, because that means that you let the actually person that actually did the crime is out there still running free, and you make the rest of society vulnerable to a real criminal why you got another person that's innocent family suffering going through this trauma that can never be erased. So it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the system is going to be the system in my eyes. And part of that is why, like, I just, like, started a program for literacy mm -hmm. because I'm not so much into saying that the system is going to change, but I just think that we could try to, like, stop people from going into the system yeah. because the system is just is the system. You know, we hear stories like yours, and what we think is, how do we make sure that doesn't happen to anybody else? Is it just literacy? Is it just books? Is it, you know, school programs? Is it neighborhood programs? Like, or do we have to change the system somehow? Do we have to disrupt it in some way? I know I'm overly blessed to be in my position right now. That's why, like, I step out and speak up, mm -hmm. because I know that if I didn't have the attorneys I have to fight for me the, the way they did endlessly nights and just being their support in me in real life, like Boss Lady and Boss Man have been my structure in real life. They have been helping me get through real life. And to have the judge and not Judge Simpson be so courageous and be able to put forth her, her, her ruling on this, on this case when nobody else wanted to touch this and there's so many you know, things that went wrong and it's, and nobody stepped up and said, you know, we, we going to fix this wrong. Right. And, and then it was also, uh, you know, a fearless reporter by the name of Francis Robles who actually mm -hmm. put out the first article years ago in the New York Times that gave me a voice for people to actually see what was going on. So it's like right. God and timing, and I know I'm one in a million. And if I ain't have a lot of them elements working together, you know, and so many people don't. So many people don't have those elements working together. You are very blessed, um, even in the midst of someone else uh, sort of, you know, taking from you and taking away from, you know, parts of your life. Rebecca, what do you think about how many people, and I think most people, assume that being wrongfully convicted is incredibly rare and doesn't happen to people very often? I don't think it's as rare as people would like to think it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a majority of cases, of course, you know, the people who go to prison are guilty. But um, there is a huge, staggering number of wrongfully convicted people in mm -hmm. prison still in the United States today and in New York because of, you know, what was going on here in the 80s and 90s 
And even today, I mean, police were, I mean, the system is made up of humans, and humans right. make mistakes and have, like, a variety of motivations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unfortunately, they also make bad decisions and do the wrong thing sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, in his case, you know, police and prostitutional misconduct is a huge problem. It causes 70 percent of wrongful convictions. Right. Um, and I do think that is something that we are capable of changing by holding these actors accountable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we believe very strongly that you know, Detective Scarcella and the prosecutors involved should all be investigated mm -hmm. and prosecuted for whatever they did wrong. I mean, Detective Scarcella, at the very least, perjury. Um, whatever is not, you know, beyond the statute of limitations, fabrication right. of evidence. I mean, people should be held accountable. And until you hold people individually accountable, mm -hmm. they are not going to change their individual actions. Absolutely. John, can you tell me the name of your organization before we get out? Because I want to make sure that people know the name. It's a voice for the unheard with the number four in the middle as representing the four. Mm -hmm. um, it's literacy program. And I agree with you, what you're saying as far as, like, the problems with the justice system, but it's a problem in our community, too, yeah. because we make ourselves vulnerable to being in this, in this justice system and not taking the blame off of anything else, but it's like even when we get inside inside the penitentiary, as a person that was grew up inside the penitentiary, mm -hmm. like, our mentality is so negative that we need to rewrite the code of conduct so, like, we could be thinking different because even if we in there in a crisis situation, we still pondering down on each other where we can't get, get above water. So, I think that's part of the holistic approach, though. It's not just talking about what's happening to people. It's also talking about how people react to what happens to them and the circumstances that they're living under. You know, I think a lot of times people do what they know, and you have to teach them some often that there are other options. Um, and I think that you're the perfect voice and the perfect person to be doing that work right now. And I'm so glad that you've decided to do it, John. Thank you so much for being here. Thank Rebecca, you thank you for us. being here as well. Unfortunately, we have to cut the conversation short here for our broadcast viewers, but you can tune in to our podcast to listen to the rest of it. Everybody loves a comeback story, even if it's a bit old. But did you know that at the turn of the century, Brooklyn was home to 45 breweries? And then there were none. Now there are several. And vinyl has been a thing for a while, but its revival has picked up steam lately, with reissues and new presses cropping up in places like Brooklyn. To talk about these two trends, we have one guest who brings them together in one location. He's the proprietor of the new bar Beer Wax with its craft brew and 5,000 LP selection. Chris Maestro, welcome to 112BK. Ashley, thank you for having me. And then the founder of one of Brooklyn's only record presses, Brooklyn Phono, Thomas Burnett. Thanks for coming on the show, Thomas. Thank you, Ashley. It's wonderful being here. Oh, I bet. I'm so happy to have you guys here. Two things that I love and that always mm. bring a lot of pleasure and joy into my life. So can we just start with you, Thomas? What do you know of vinyl's history in Brooklyn? Um, vinyl's history, when I started, we are hitting the 100 mark, uh, mm. serendipitous, wow. so, um, which was in 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. and, um, the format is uh, changed in the 60s with contemporary medium, where you had long play introduced, which is on the cutting side, and, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, it's phased out in the 80s, 90s, with where it was the main commercial format, and then mm -hmm. it transitioned into CD, and now MP3. Right. But people still love their vinyl, mm -hmm. I have to say, and get really excited about it, especially in Brooklyn. And Chris, can you tell me, what inspired you to make this marriage of vinyl and local craft beer? Well, really, they were two long-time passions of mine. Mm -hmm. um, well, the records before the beer. Let's but, hope. Yes. Okay. But, uh, you know, I really wanted to marry these two things. Uh, mm -hmm to go to work every day and say I'm amongst these two things that I really feel could uh, work so well uh, alongside each other. Mm -hmm. And from the neighborhood reception, it's been uh, quite a success. And I feel like people really love the fact that they can just drink a craft beer and then listen to, to analog music. Uh. I, it's just, it's, it's the making of like the perfect day, is a good cold beer and listening to a record all the way through both sides. It's just, mm, it's, it's a beautiful it's thing. Thomas, can I ask, what about you? What was the inspiration for starting a vinyl press? 
Well, in grade school, um, listening to records, uh, listening to the radio coming home. So, you know, mm -hmm. you get home a couple hours before your parents, turning yes. on the traffic jam and being able to listen to the mixes, uh, mm -hmm. Marley Marl and Red Alert. Mm -hmm. Like, this was, this was my childhood. And so then as I, uh, you know, grew older, I saw, oh, I can play the records. And mm -hmm. I had a, quite a few friends, and we spun records together. And it was like a social activity, but then you could have a, larger social activity where you would have a party and play music and that would always be really fun and then we're here in New York where we have great venues and mm -hmm. great places to go to and uh, enjoy yourself. I really like the idea that this is not a retro trend, that this is something that people are starting to understand is a beautiful artifact in both cases, mm -hmm. microbrewers and with beer. Because I think that also microbreweries, like as they go along, like they create little traditions. There's like something that it's in different seasons and it encourages people to sort of like I think not have to have something immediately. I love that on a record you can't fast forward and get mm -hmm. to the song you know. You've gotta listen to the record, you've gotta get there. And beer is the same way, you kinda wait for the thing you like, mm -hmm. which I love, 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 love. Do you do reissues or custom orders? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I wonder about that like everyone specifically with you. Yeah, everyone, e everyone is, is special. Yeah. So I brought what we're doing recently right now. Yes. And um, I, I feel beer is uh, always wonderful. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, everyone is uh, a custom order. And we mm -hmm. do uh, larger commercial jobs, but not so much. Mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're a niche, and um, uh, each particular customer, we get to know them a little bit and mm -hmm. like uh, we are of course um, uh, get too involved sometimes where we uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah can't keep can't keep up with uh, the work sometimes yeah which is wonderful and then you end up living under a rock for a little while yeah and digging out yeah. and taking time <laughs> which is uh, normal I, it's a, it's a good thing okay you do your best i love that do you, Chris, what are some of the highlights of your 5,000 platter collection? Mm. Talk to me about that. 5,000? 5,000. And it's, I mean, it's been a lot of luck and a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say some of the highlights are some of my Fania records that I really love and some of the, mm. the covers for, you know, some of the old Willie Colon records are mm -hmm. incredible. So those to me are really my favorites. Yeah? Yeah. I'm really into Bossa Nova. Do you have any we do. of that? I wish yes. we had more, but we definitely do. And it uh, gets played a lot, that beer wax. Fantastic, because yeah. I love Bossa Nova. Um, Tom's real quick, can you make the case for analog? Uh, it's the medium is the message. So mm -hmm. uh, yes, I can make the case for analog. Um, if you like poetry, if you like film, if you like pictures or painting, each medium has uh, its time and place, mm -hmm. and uh, analog records have their time and place. Mm -hmm. And I like that time and place. And uh, you know, it's at a, if it's at a bar having a drink with a friend, and uh, there's analog going on, that makes it really special. That's yeah. a that's a great experience. So um, you know, t medium is the message. Yes, yeah. I love that. Yeah. And Chris, can you make the case for this delicious craft brew you brought in? Can you pick three for us to try? Of course. I mean, I really try to focus on local, and that's what we do at Beer Wax. We try to make sure that 80% of the beers we serve are from local, meaning New York State. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're gonna choose three, let's just do, let's do Brooklyn, right? Okay, yes. Um, so Transmitter. Okay. Um, so this right here oh. is a hibiscus wit, so wit beer. Um, and Transmitter is moving actually from uh, Long Island City to Brooklyn, mm -hmm. basically right down Vanderbilt all the way at the end. Mm -hmm. So they are definitely now officially a Brooklyn brewery. Fantastic. Um, let's do Threes, which is in Gowanus on Douglas Street. Ooh. And let's do, although Evil Twin, um, its owner, Yepe, was owner of Torst in Greenpoint. Okay. Um, they're going to be on the border of Bushwick um, and, uh, and Ridgewood, so. We'll take it. Yeah, so let's do that too. We're going to call it for us. We're going to say Brooklyn. And then this is also brewed with uh, Root & Branch. It's a collaboration. Um, so they're a bit of a pneumatic gypsy brewer, but it's fantastic. This, they do amazing beers. So let's do those three. Let's do those three. Okay, who's drinking with <clears throat> me is the question. Let's start with Short Fuse. Let's do it. Oh, by the way, this is our 100th episode, so cheers Ooh, to that. Cheers to that. Cheers. 
Does evil twin have a real twin? Yes, so a little history on evil twin. Yepe mm -hmm. has an actual brother who's also a brewer, um, and he owns McKellar. McKellar just opened up a brewery in City Field. Um, but they're actual twins, and the story goes that they don't even get along. They don't right. speak to each other. So I'm not sure if that's true or not, but, um, oh. but that's the story. And one of them's the evil twin. I wonder which one that is. <laughs> it's me. You know, when I was yeah, growing no up, problem. people always thought my brother and I were twins and because we were about 14 months apart, and I resented it because he was a boy, and I did not want to look like a boy. Um, so I started wearing earrings every day so that I wouldn't look like my brother. Uh, newsflash, I grew up to look like the brown M&M, and my brother looks like a model. <laughs> so part of me really wishes we were twins. Uh, but now I think he's the evil twin. Growing up, I thought I was. Hmm. But I think, uh, you know, siblings, there's always one evil one. And it's definitely me because... I am exceedingly, exceedingly pretty. <laughs> and also, no, I'm just kidding. Um, that's not really why. Cheers to toast. you guys. Cheers. Cheers to 100 episodes. So let me ask you both, what's the first flavor that you taste? The first thing I taste, I think, is wheat. Wheat? Yes. Okay. Is that right? Am I messing it up already? Does anyone have taste anything slightly smoky? Yeah. Right. What is that? So this is a, a smoked hellas. It's a fooder fermented smoked hellas, um, and I'll explain all that. So yeah. a fooder essentially is a large vessel, typically um, which had wine before, um, and they empty out the wine. They mm -hmm. they condition the actual tank per se. It's made out of wood, mm -hmm. um, and they ferment beer in that in that vessel. Mm -hmm. So it's fooder fermented. Um, so. So it sometimes takes on the characteristic of, mm -hmm. of the wood. Um, and then it's smoked. They use smoked malts, so you have a smokiness to it. You taste it on the back of the yeah, tongue yep. and breathing through the nose. Uh, and then Helles mm -hmm. is, a, is a traditional German style that was primarily from Munich in Germany. Mm. Um, so it's a style that isn't very popular in the United States, but there, there are a lot of breweries that are reviving some older styles that aren't as super popular. That's fantastic. Well. We're going to taste more of these, and it's going to be fantastic, but I'm going to close out the show while we finish the rest of these beers, because that's all for today. And we're off next Monday for Memorial Day, so enjoy the unofficial start of summer. And then we'll be back later in the week with conversations about climate change to mark the one-year anniversary of President Trump's announcement that the U.S. would pull out of the Paris Climate Treaty. Rejoice. Hope you can join us. All right, now we're going to keep drinking. All right. okay. Cheers. Cheers to 100. So, yeah. Cheers to That's amazing. Uh, Thank you. Guys. How do you feel? Yeah, of course. Sure. I feel you. amazing, to be perfectly honest. And this is really good. My yeah. wife says that you have to look into someone's eye when you cheers them. Yes, or else, yeah. Uh, do you? Yeah, yeah, you have to. Yes. Yeah. Is that the thing? Yeah, that's the thing. I didn't know. I usually do, but then I felt like I was making people feel weird. No, make them feel weird. The okay, okay. Don't worry. I'm just going to make them feel weird. Yeah.